Let me open up in prayer and then we're going to get started. Lord, we thank you for this morning. Thanks for those who are in attendance. We pray that if there's anybody else that's on their way, that you'd get them here quickly and safely. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would bless this time this morning, not just in this class, uh, but uh, or all the speakers. Help us to do a good job to, to make you look good. And we just pray for, uh, for you to be glorified in what we do all of today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I am Keith Walker of Evidence Ministries. My wife there has the yellow shirt on. And together, we founded Evidence Ministries in 1995. And I've been a full-time missionary to Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons since 1999. So this is what I do. My wife teaches private voice at uh, SAC Community College. And together, that's how we do what we do to get what we need to feed our kids. So uh, I'm glad everybody's here this morning. What we're going to be doing is going through do's and don'ts of how to respond to Jehovah's Witnesses when they show up at your door. Now, you may run across Jehovah's Witnesses in other venues. You, know, you might have family or friends who are Jehovah's Witnesses. These do's and don'ts, for the most part, will apply to those situations as well. But uh, but for the purpose of, of today's class, I put all this together with the idea in mind that they're actually coming to your door because that's usually how most people are going to meet the Jehovah's Witnesses. They're not allowed to befriend you unless they think they've got a halfway decent shot of recruiting you into their organization. So it's, it, it can be difficult to start a relationship with Jehovah's Witnesses, but if it's gonna start anywhere, it's usually gonna start with them in the field service, which is what they call their, their public ministry, regardless of whether it's going door to door or hanging out down at the Alamo with a cart passing out tracks. You know, all that's called field service. So uh, I'm gonna read through the first paragraph. Now I'm not gonna read through all of these. There are six pages of information here. We don't have the time to get through all of that. So some of it I'm gonna kind of gloss over, but I did take some time to write a bunch of things out because what I want, I want this to be a good resource for you to go home, read through it, kind of remember some of the things that I taught here this morning, and then you've also got enough information to kind of put things together so that you really understand what some of the do's and don'ts are. And then at the end, we've got a little witnessing method that I recommend that you use with Jehovah's Witnesses, and I'll, I'll explain all that towards the end. We're going to spend most of our time, is there a clock in here? I don't see a clock. I'll, I'll provide you one. No, I, I got a watch, that's fine. Um, so most of our time is going to be on the do's and the don'ts, and uh, then I want to hit the witnessing thing sort of at the end, leaving some minutes, few minutes for you guys to ask some questions, because I know I'm not going to cover everything. So, all right, this first paragraph. One of the most frequent requests that we receive is from Christians who want to know how to witness to Jehovah's Witnesses when they come to their door. They're usually looking for a specific verse to act as a silver bullet that will end the debate and open the eyes of the cultist to the futility of their, of their belief system and then point them to the sufficiency of Christ. This workshop will teach Christians how to communicate in an effective way while avoiding common pitfalls. Now, the silver bullet, I can't tell you how many times people have said, Keith, what's the one verse that you can give to a Jehovah's Witness that's gonna change their mind? If there was a one verse, there wouldn't be any Jehovah's Witnesses left because I would have got them all if it was that easy. But it's not that easy. People are reached through different ways. I was saved at a Billy Graham crusade. Okay, that may not have worked for some of you. Some of you uh, might have grown up in Christian homes or some of you might have had some you know, sort of tragic life experience or whatever. God uses different methods, different ways to reach different people. And he's not gonna use the same verse every time. There's no silver bullet to this. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses are people, just like anybody else. It, people have different personalities and their interests differ, vary depending upon the person and their life history, their background. So there's a lot of things that can work with Jehovah's Witnesses. There is, again, there is no silver bullet. Some of these are gonna be common sense kinds of points that I bring out, uh, like the first one, pray. Everybody here is thinking, yeah, right, duh, of course we're going to pray. Um, but why I put that first is because 
I want us all to realize that, yes, that is a common discipline of the Christian life, but that is not just a common discipline. That's our lifeline. John 15 is what I've got quoted here, and the reason why is because it's so pertinent, not only to the idea of reaching Jehovah's Witnesses, but to our everyday Christian walk. If we are not in touch with Jesus, if we are not connected to the vine, how in the world do you expect to bear fruit? Fruit don't grow unless they're attached to the vine. That's the whole point that Jesus makes in John chapter 15. So if you think that you've got enough Bible knowledge to kind of handle this on your own and talk to Jehovah's Witness, you will get spanked. And I'd love to be there to watch it because Jesus is the one who gives us strength. Jesus is the one who we need to be in contact with, connected with. Otherwise, we're wasting our time. We really are. There isn't anything that I can say or do that's going to save anybody. Salvation is God's business. I tell people all the time, I'm not in production. I'm not even in sales. I'm in advertising. You talk about Jesus. You talk about what he did. You talk about the gospel message. And it's God's business what he does with that. I pray towards a certain end. I hand it all over to God and I watch him work. And that is awesome because it it totally takes the pressure off of me. I don't have to perform. I don't have to worry about, oh, if I just would have quoted this one silver bullet verse, then they would have got saved. Or, you know, that's arrogant thinking, really, because it's not about me and it's not about what I say or don't say. Now, these points do help. I mean, they're d- basic guidelines. You certainly don't want to get in the way of what God is doing. But then at the same time, you don't want to take, you don't want to adopt the mentality that it really has anything to do with our performance any more than our salvation does. Again, that's God's, God's work. It's God's business. And we really, we we need to remember that when we talk to anybody. So I hope I've made that point sufficiently clear. All right. Do ask questions. Questions are very, very important. And I learned this technique from uh, the book, How to Rescue Your Loved One from the Watchtower. They are selling that book in the fellowship hall this morning. I think they've got it for 10 bucks. If you really want to know more about how to witness to Jehovah's Witnesses, you have to get that book. That book completely changed my paradigm on how to witness to Jehovah's Witnesses. I read it Um, excuse me, I was saved in 88, left Bible college in 92, read that book um, probably a year or two after that, after we had moved here to San Antonio. And it really made a shift in my thinking of how to reach them because, I mean, the guy who wrote it is an ex-Jehovah's Witness elder. So he kind of knows what he's talking about. But one of the things that he really pointed out that has stuck with me all these years was the idea of asking questions. And he points out that Jesus taught by asking questions. Who do men say that I am? And then he takes and he draws the answer right out of Peter's mouth. You're the Christ, the son of the living God. Uh, So in a sense, Jesus taught Socratically. He asked a lot of questions to get people to think. And the reason why that is so important with Jehovah's Witnesses is because they are taught that they're the only true Christians They're God's organization, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society is God's organization, and we are part of the great whore of Babylon. Yeah, I know. (laughs) Real kind and loving term, right? Uh, They get that out of the book of Revelation. Anybody outside of the Watchtower who claims the name of Christ is part of Christendom. And you may have heard that term before, but when a Jehovah's Witness says it, it's meant in a derogatory means. It's meant... Uh, as an insult, almost. Oh, you're part of Christendom. So they don't trust you. They don't trust anything you have to say about the Bible because you are not connected to, you're probably thinking John 15, right? As Christians, we would be connected to Jesus. The Jehovah's Witness is, has to be connected to the Watchtower. You're not associated with the Watchtower, and that is the means that God uses to provide food for his people. <clears throat> so unless you're connected with that organization, you really don't know your Bible. So really, what are you going to teach a Jehovah's Witness? In their minds, they're thinking, nothing. You don't have anything to say because you're an apostate. 
Why would I want to listen to you? But what are they there to do? They're there to teach you. They're there to save you from your uh, Babylonish beliefs. So if that's their thinking, if that's their paradigm, you can still use that. Stay in the student role. Allow them to teach. But what they don't realize is that you can control the conversation by asking questions. Whoever's asking the questions is controlling the conversation. Uh, there, you've got a green handout there. Uh, it's called Student Role Teaching. We're not going to go through that now, but I did want everybody to have one because in that, on that document, I explain what student role teaching is. And it, it's basically what I've been saying. It's the idea of asking questions. So if I were to tell you two plus two is four and you don't trust me, you could say, well, you know, Keith said that, so I don't know that that's true. But if I put it in the form of a question, isn't the sum of two plus two the whole number between three and five? Everybody here thought, especially the math teacher over here, everybody here thought four. And I didn't have to tell you that. That's your answer. So you don't even have to verbalize that answer, but it's in your head. You have to deal with it. So if I ask a question that is an obvious question that leads to an answer that is contrary to what the Watchtower teaches, the Jehovah's Witness has to deal with that. And I'm not challenging them. I'm not telling them what the Bible says. So I'm not viewed as a threat. I'm viewed as somebody who has a legitimate question that they feel obligated to answer. You see how we've just totally switched everything? Now they're thinking, how do I answer this question? Because that is what the Bible says. What do I do with this? God can use that. Uh, I've heard the, the illustration of like a, like a little pebble in somebody's shoe. You know, it's not the mountain that's going to bother you. It's that little rock that's in your shoe on the way up. That's going to bother you. you that's going to make you stop and pull out your shoe and find out, you know, how in the world does this get in my sock? You know, I mean, I've had that happen. That's what bothers you. It's not the big mountain thing. So student role teaching and asking questions is very, very important. I would say it is an absolute must to really know how to do when you are talk talking with Jehovah's Witnesses. Because again, they're the teacher, you're the student, I'm not gonna listen to you, you came to me because I'm the teacher, you don't have anything of value to say. That is their mindset. So if we, can t if we just use that and w control the conversation by asking those questions, then because they're the teacher, we're using that whole idea against them to come up with answers of what the Bible really says. So let's move on to uh, page two here. Do commit to a Bible study. You had a question, ma'am. How to rescue your loved one from the watchtower. Yeah. One of the methods that um, David Reed likes to use is the idea of false prophecy, of getting copies of watchtower information and showing them the false prophecies. I don't have any false prophecy packs here, but I do have some. So if you guys are interested in doing more of what David Reed said in his book, contact us and I can get you one of those packets. I've got a better watchtower library than most kingdom halls do. So uh, if I don't have it, I can get it. All right, so do commit to a Bible study. Jehovah's Witnesses are taught, as I mentioned earlier, they're taught that they really can't befriend you uh, because you're not part of, part of the organization. They're very, uh, they isolate themselves in a number of ways. And one of the ways that they stay clean is to, uh, is to keep their associations restricted only to those who are faithful Jehovah's Witnesses. So really the only opportunity you're gonna have with them is when they're out in their field service or they come to, the, come to your door. So if you commit to a Bible study, then you've got an ongoing meeting with these people. Uh, my wife has met with the same couple of JW ladies for three years. That is unheard of because they are taught that once they realize that they're not going to convert you, you've got to move on and spend your time on somebody else. So by committing to a Bible study, that gives you a long-term opportunity to reach these Jehovah's Witnesses. And we really do prefer long-term witnessing over the short blasts um, for the very simple reason that farmers like uh, gentle rains rather than torrential downpours. Because you can take your seed, you can scatter it, and then have it all washed away by some gully washing you know, rainstorm. 
versus a slow gentle rain that's actually going to settle the seed and not wash away the topsoil. It's going to be something that's better for your crop than a ton of water at once. So sometimes that approach can work with Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, the witnessing by fire hydrant kind of thing. Um, but for the most part, that's not how it works. It's going to be the slow, gentle rain of asking a lot of questions and getting into the word. So by committing to that Bible study, you get much more opportunity with them. All right, do stick to the main topic. How many of you have had conversations with Jehovah's Witnesses? Show of hands. Okay, that's the majority of us in this room. Do they ever like to stay on one topic at a time? No, they like to bounce around. And the reason why they bounce around, that's kind of how they're taught. They're taught topically, not uh, like what we're learning here at this conference, verse by verse, expositionally. But they will bounce around to other topics, and they get really, really good at it when you make them uncomfortable with something that you've just proven about, like, say, the deity of Christ. If you are pointing out a verse to them that they don't like, oh, yeah, well, what about war? Or what about hell? Or what about Christmas trees? Or what about the immortality of the soul? I mean, they will change subjects on you quicker than you can blink. And they're good at it because they know a lot of Bible verses. They don't know their Bibles, but they know a lot of Bible verses. They know their watchtower theology. So if you get to a point where you're talking to a Jehovah's Witness and, and you're staying on topic and they get uncomfortable, what I like to do, if they've got a question or they want to jump somewhere else, I'll say, you know what, that's a great question. It's a good point. I, I do want to talk about this. And I'll write it down and say, now, how did you word that question? write it down and say, I'd like to get back to that later. But my question is really this. And now think about it. who's the student? You are. If you've got a question and you're the teacher, then whose responsibility is it to answer that question? I'm not concerned about this right now. That's not, that's not making sense to me right now. You've got to reach me where I'm at. This is where I'm at right now. Help me understand this. Gently bring them back to that main point. Stay on topic. Otherwise, you will find yourself, and I've done this in the past. I've, I've done, I, please learn from my mistakes. <laughs> I've been doing this more than 20 years, and I've made tons of mistakes along the way. But I've, I've talked with a Jehovah's Witness for an hour on my doorstep and probably covered, not kidding, no, no exaggeration, 10 or 15 topics all in one conversation. And that's really kind of fruitless. All it is is really just an exercise in, okay, who knows more Bible verses? And unfortunately for Christians, most of the time, it's the Jehovah's Witness who's winning that Bible ping pong battle. You know, you're just bouncing verses back and forth until somebody doesn't have any more verses. And the person who's got more verses wins. So don't allow them to jump all over the place. You've got to stick to the main topic. All right, do look at Bible verses in context. Now that should be with anyone with Mormons too, but especially with the Jehovah's Witnesses, because the Jehovah's Witnesses are taught so much to jump around that they really don't look at the context. For instance, you'll see I've got um, Revelation 19.1 notated there at the bottom. Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses are taught that only 144,000 faithful Jehovah's Witnesses will go to heaven. All other Jehovah's Witnesses will live on paradise earth turning this garden or, or this, this world back into a Garden of Eden type uh, atmosphere. So eternity of gardening, that, that's your eternal life. That does not sound appealing to me. I want to be with Jesus. I don't want to be gardening all this time. I'll get to you in a second. I'll get to you in a sec. So, so they look at the 144,000 and they'll say those are going to heaven. Everybody else is on earth. But Revelation 19.1 clearly says that the great crowd, that's their term, the great crowd is in heaven, and it's not on earth. And they get that number from Revelation chapter 7, Revelation chapter 14. And when you look at the context, again, we're talking about basically Jewish missionaries in the tribulation time. Yeah. Well, yeah, they don't believe a lot of things. So you got to kind of take it one at a time with them. Um, but by looking at the context, you can help them to see your position. And usually they're not interested in understanding your position because it's wrong. 
So why do I want to know what you know? But you've got to point out to them that that because I hold whatever position, I'm not understanding your position. And I hold my position based off of these verses. So if that position is wrong, then you've got to help me understand that. I, I was meeting with a Jehovah's Witness elder for 18 months. And one of the things that I had to keep telling him or asking him really is, are you trying to refute me or are you trying to understand me? And the reason why I kept asking that question to him is because he would, he would say something in the Bible and I'd say, oh, that's really different. And of course, that's an invitation for him to say different than what? Well, different than what I believe based on Scripture. Well, what do you believe based on Scripture? So now he's given me an invitation to tell him what I believe. So when I tell him something and then he would go, well, no, that can't be because of this, 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 this and this. And I said, no, 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 wait a minute, Matt, Matt, do you even understand what I just said? I'm not asking you to refute what I believe. You asked me what I believed. So I'm telling you, you can't refute what I believe unless you understand it. Because you could be refuting something I don't believe. So I can't even really agree with you or disagree with you unless I understand what it is that you're saying. And it's the same way with me. You, you, you can't refute what you don't understand. And he, he took that. He understood that. You're right. I had to keep reminding him of that because he would just flip into JW mode and, you know, start attacking. But we've got to get them to try to understand because they're really not going to teach somebody unless they take the time to understand where that person is coming from and why they believe what they believe. Yes, ma'am. Well, that's a great question. I'll get to it in here. It's one of the do's and don'ts. Um, but yeah, that is a good question. How do I know when I'm wasting my time with somebody? And, and I know that sounds harsh that way, but it's true. And the Bible talks about that. Don't waste your time with people like this. So we'll get to that. All right. Uh, one of the very, very key things that you need to do is work on relationship with the JWs. Again, because they're not allowed to befriend you unless they think they've got a decent shot of winning you over you're not going to have any contact with them. So when you're meeting with them, talk to them. Find out about their lives, their, their wives' names, their kids' names, where they go to school, what kind of, you know, what are your interests? What do you like to do? What was your life like before you were a Jehovah's Witness? Were you always raised a Jehovah's Witness? What are you looking forward to in the future? I mean, find out everything that any normal person would do in any normal relationship. You've got to talk. And... If you build a real, genuine, solid relationship, those discussions that you are having are going to last much, much longer than they, were, than they would otherwise. Now, one of the things that I would do is I'm having these discussions with, I had uh, two discussions with JW elders, one that lasted for 11 months and then the one after that for 18 months. And what I would do is I would come home after our discussion and I would write a blog post, sometimes 3,500 words of a blog post on how our discussion went. Some of it was narrative and a lot of it was um, point by point conversation. You know, JW said this, KW said this. And, uh, and I got into really heavy detail about how our conversations went. Now, what I do ministry wise, I do a lot on online, particularly on Facebook. I know it sounds weird. I'm a cyber missionary, uh, but Jehovah's Witnesses will do that. They'll go online and they'll look at things that they would never look at before. There was the internet because you've got the anonymity of the internet. Nobody else knows what you're really reading. So there are tons of private Facebook groups of ex-Jehovah's Witnesses in particular or Jehovah's Witnesses who are in dialogue with Christians and they'll go back and forth on different things. So what I would do is I would post a link to my blog saying here's the conversation I had with this JW elder. And the, the compliments that I loved the most were from the ex-JW atheists and agnostics who would say, you know what, I still don't believe what you believe, but at least I understand it. And I thought, that's awesome, because that is a step in the right direction. They are starting to hear this. I had a, a Jehovah's Witness agnostic correcting people on the doctrine of the Trinity. 
and saying, that's not, you're attacking what Christians believe, but that's not what Christians believe. They believe this. And then she tagged me and says, Is that, did I get this right, Keith? And I said, yeah, that was great. Great definition of the Trinity. Uh, she had basically quoted it from something that I had said that I quoted from somebody else. So she's understanding these things. She's understanding what Christians mean when we say certain things. And that was kind of cool to, to see that. So I would post these things online. And one of the questions that kept coming back to me from the ex-Jehovah's Witnesses, regardless of whether they were Christian or not, is they would say, why is this guy still meeting with you? All the stuff that you are covering, my goodness, he has got to be thinking about these things because I'm thinking about these things. How is it that he is still meeting with you? And the only thing that I could come up with, and, and it sounds kind of funny, but the only thing that I could come up with is he likes me. He really likes me. <laughs> and that's why our discussions lasted so long. It's because he genuinely enjoyed, and I did too, genuinely enjoyed the time that we had together. Sometimes we would meet for two and a half hours and wouldn't get into the Bible until an hour later of just talking, just keeping up with each other. You know, what's going on with this situation with your kids and, and their, you know, real father, because he's the stepfather, you know, how's, what's going on? And, and we would talk and I would tell him, you know, I'm praying for you guys. I'm praying for your family. And he would say, that he appreciates that, that scares him to death because I believe in a different God, according to them. Um, but he understood what I was getting at. He understood my heart that I cared about this situation. So I think his wife finally got the better of him and he's no longer meeting with me. But there's no way that that conversation would have lasted 18 months had I really not invested the time in him to get to know this guy. I mean, we do genuinely enjoy each other's company. So by spending time on relationship, and I've spent a lot of time this morning talking about relationship, that's going to get you a lot farther than just blasting verses at each other. So, all right, moving on. Uh, do be ready to give your testimony in Jesus and in forgiveness of sins. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses have absolutely no assurance of salvation whatsoever. Their salvation is based mostly on two things. Number one, meeting attendance, and there's about five hours of meetings that they have to go to every week. And two, their field service, and they actually have a time card that they're supposed to fill out. You've got to have, have at least 10 hours a month of field service put in on your time card to be considered an active Jehovah's Witness. Now, they won't take you off their roles of membership or disfellowship you or anything like that if you don't turn in that time card. But unless you're associated with Jehovah's Channel Communication, you don't have any salvation. So these JWs are doing this work because they believe their salvation depends on it. Now, obviously the question is, well, exactly how much do you need to do? If it's all based on you, what do you need to do? They have no assurance. So by you explaining what you believe, they're going to reject it, but they're going to see your heart and they're going to understand your conviction when you testify about Jesus and about his sufficient. It's not Jesus only. I mean, it is Jesus only, but it's also only Jesus. Only Jesus in the sense of that I don't need an organization. What does an organization look like dying for my sins? <coughs> It's about Jesus. So when you focus on Jesus, in fact, Matt told me, the Jehovah's Witness told me, he says, he says, Keith, your love for Jesus is so much that you're missing out on Jehovah God. And I took that as a compliment <laughs> because he saw how committed I am to Christ. Of course, he doesn't understand that Jesus is Jehovah. He is the one true God. Uh, I'll get into more of that later. So also do your homework. It's going to take some time and effort to reach these Jehovah's Witnesses. And their theology is two things, ever-changing and confusing. And it's confusing because it's ever-changing. Seriously, they have a, a doctrine called New Light, which gives the Watchtower license to change what every Jehovah's Witness believes immediately. In fact, if the Watchtower today were to print something saying that it's okay to have birthday celebrations, Jehovah's Witnesses would be having birthday celebrations that day. 
So they don't actually believe what the Bible says. They believe what the Watchtower says the Bible says. That's their authority. So it takes a lot of homework to kind of dig out, okay, what is it that Jehovah's Witnesses believe today? They actually have a phrase called current truth because it might not have been true yesterday and it might not be true tomorrow. I asked the Jehovah's Witness elder a different one years ago. I said, what is it that you believe now that you might not believe in 10 years? And he says, I don't know. That's a good question. Well, my Bible hasn't changed in 2000 years. So really, why would you subject yourself to something like that? But the point is, you have to really put forth a lot of effort to understand where they're coming from because their system is, it's very confusing at sometimes. Sometimes I don't even really understand some of the things that they're pointing out that the Watchtower magazines are pointing out. And I'll go to the XJWs or even current JWs and say, wait, now what about this? But they used to believe this. Yeah, I know, but it's this way now. So it's gonna take some time and some effort to really understand their system. Also, don't reject their literature. And the reason why is because they keep track of not only their time, but they keep track of what kind of literature they place with people. So it's kind of like, uh, you know, kudos to them. They placed X amount of Watchtower magazines. So if they see that you're interested and read it too, really take the information, read it. It's going to give you more insight into what they believe so that you can have more questions to ask. And if you don't want it, then call me and give it to me so I can just put it in my library. Uh, but if you take that literature, that communicates to them that you're interested and they will come back. Now, if they do show up at your door um, and you really don't have the time to talk to them, you know, you've got a kid in the tub or the pipe is leaking or the dog is, you know, barfing on the floor or whatever, just get their phone number. Say, let's exchange numbers. I can't talk to you now. I really do want to talk to you. I just can't now. Let's exchange phone numbers and I'll get back with you and then we can set up a time that's convenient for both of you which leads right into the next one. Don't let 2 John 10 and 11 keep you from meeting with Jehovah's Witnesses. Lots of people will ask me the question, what about 2 John 10 and 11? Which says basically that if somebody comes to your house and doesn't bear this teaching, that you're not to allow them into your home. Now, I wanna read this paragraph here and then I'll talk about it a little bit. Many Christians misunderstand the cultural and historical context around why John instructed Christians not to receive false teachers into your, into your house. Like many Christian teachers, false teachers also traveled from city to city in their preaching work. First century churches did not have their own buildings, but met in private homes. John is instructing house churches not to allow these false teachers to teach in these private homes. Even if a Christian is not comfortable with having a Jehovah's Witness in their home, there is nowhere in scripture that forbids Christians from meeting in the homes of Jehovah's Witnesses or in a neutral location like a restaurant or some other public place. So my view is that in the first century, that's what John was talking about. He's saying, don't allow these false teachers to come and teach in your church, your house church. So that would be like, you know, having this conference and then allowing the Jehovah's Witnesses to give one of the plenary sessions in the chapel. We're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. Why? Because they're, they're teaching false doctrine. So we're not going to have that in our church. I don't believe that was referring to our individual homes and having non-Christians come into our home and talk about spiritual things. Otherwise, what are you going to do with the Jewish plumber? Right? Because he doesn't bring the teaching of Jesus, doesn't bring the teaching of Christ. So I can't have you in my home. Well, you know, that is a question I have never asked when I call for somebody to come do work on my house. Are they a Christian? You know, I want to make sure they do a good job. Whether or not they're Christian is another issue. So that's my belief on what John was getting to. You don't have to agree with me on that position. You're entitled to your own position. But even if you do disagree, that does not give us license to keep from talking with them because you can still meet in their home, which I've done, or in neutral locations. Now our house is marked. The Jehovah's Witnesses in the territory that we live in, they will skip our house when they go door to door because they know who we are and about our ministry. So when I do meet with Jehovah's Witnesses who haven't heard about us, I can't meet at our house because then they'll connect the dots and go, oh, you're that guy. So we meet somewhere else. We met at Whataburger. You know, we met at McDonald's. We've met all, you know, gyms, any restaurant, pick a restaurant. I don't have any favorites. 
So I can still meet with them, and, and you can too. This is not going to keep us. Second John 10 and 11 is not going to keep us from talking with Jehovah's Witnesses. All right, this is a biggie. Don't immediately discuss the deity of Christ or the Trinity. A lot of reasons for that. First off, Christians, for the most part, do not know how to effectively handle these two topics. Now, in the mind of the Jehovah's Witness, the, de the deity of Christ and the Trinity are the same thing. It's because they don't understand what the doctrine of the Trinity is. Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. If deity of Christ is, I'm only talking about the deity of Jesus. That's only one of the persons of the Trinity, not three. Again, same concept in their mind. But so many Christians are not capable of talking with a Jehovah's Witness about this. And that is the number one thing that Jehovah's Witnesses love to attack, those two doctrines. So does it make a whole lot of sense for Christians in their weakest point to go after JWs in their strongest point? No, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Now, you can get into those things once you really have done your homework. Call me and say, you know, hey, Keith, I want to talk about this. What should I do? I can tell you what verses to go at, how they're going to respond to those verses, and how to respond to their response based off of those verses, and then bring up verses that they don't have any responses for. I've got the experience where I can do that. Um, but jumping right into the deity of Christ, that's the quickest way to lose a Jehovah's Witness. In fact, the first JW that I met with, the guy that I met with 11 months, I did not want to get into the deity of Christ, and he just kept pushing it. And I almost lost him because he kept talking about it, and I would answer his questions. And I had to finally say, uh, you know, we can get to this later. You've got this book you want me to go through. Is this topic taught in this book? He says, yes. I said, where? Chapter 4. Okay, let's start with chapter 1. When we got to chapter 4, the discussion was over because he couldn't handle what we were doing. So had I started with chapter 4 at the beginning, I wouldn't have had 11 months with this guy. I would have had a couple of weeks. So you got to be smart about how you do things. <clears throat> All right, let's move on here. This is a no-brainer. Don't mention the word cult, unless you're talking about the Mormons, okay? Um, don't do that, because you're not going to get very far at all. If somebody said that you belong to a cult, is that going to open up dialogue? It would for me, because I, I, you know, I would go for that. A cult? Why in the world do you think I belong to a cult? But most people are going to be turned off by that, and they're going to say, no, you're just here to attack me. You think I belong to a cult. What do you think? I'm stupid? Not understanding that being your intelligence has nothing to do with being involved in a cult. It has everything to do with deception. And smart people can be deceived. Anybody can be deceived. But they don't get that. A lot of Christians don't get that. So to, to accuse them of belonging to a cult, just don't. It, it, it's not going to get you anywhere at all. Also, don't major on the minors. All right, Talking with Jehovah's Witnesses about... Christmas trees or holidays or military service or even blood transfusions, although each of those things are important issues, they're not, for the most part, they're not going to get you where you need to go to get the Jehovah's Witness to really consider the claims of Christ and to really reconsider their involvement with the Watchtower. Now, these issues are more important for somebody who is actually thinking about leaving the Watchtower it helps them fill in gaps. It helps them get their baggage sorted. But to try an evangelistic conversation with them right off the bat with these secondary or even tertiary issues, that generally doesn't bear much fruit. Now, God can do anything, all right? And I'm not trying to discount that. But what I am saying is for the most part, those things aren't as important as other issues. All right. Also, don't tell somebody what they believe. Uh, and the example for that with Jehovah's Witnesses is because they believe that only 144,000 people go to heaven, they're the only ones who are part of the new covenant in their theology, which means that Jesus is their mediator. He's not mediator for the great crowd. So he's not the mediator for 99.9% .9 of Jehovah's Witnesses alive today. He's only the mediator for the 144,000. So if you tell a Jehovah's Witness, well, you believe that Jesus isn't even your mediator, 
Jehovah's Witnesses may not know about this doctrine. And I've talked to plenty of Jehovah's Witnesses who don't know this doctrine, who don't realize that, yeah, that is what the Watchtower teaches. So if you accuse them of believing something they don't believe, first off, it's rude. Second, you're not going to come across as someone who has very much credibility because, hey, I'm the Jehovah's Witness. How can you tell me what I believe? That just doesn't come off right. But if you ask it, put it in the form of a question, doesn't the Watchtower teach that Jesus is the mediator only for 144,000? Oh, no, the Watchtower doesn't teach that. And then contact me and get the reference for it, and I give you a bunch of different Watchtower references, and, and they look at that and say, oh, yeah, I get, well, of course I believe that Jesus only mediates for the 144,000. Instantly, they've changed their mind. But you can say, no, wait a minute, I thought you said this. You can genuinely be confused and say, how did you switch so quickly? I don't understand this. But the point is, don't accuse them of believing something. Don't tell them what they believe. Ask questions. I've had people before tell me what I believe. This is a Christian. Keith, you believe this. And I said, no, I don't. He said, yes, you do. <laughs> and I said, I'm the world's foremost authority on what Keith Walker believes. And I'm telling you, I don't believe that. And he was shocked, but he wasn't listening either. It was rude. I mean, it was offensive the way that he was doing that. So we don't want to be the ones doing that to them. All right, don't let the discussion turn into a heated debate. And if you tell somebody what they believe, that very well could be. Uh, but religion is an emotional issue. And Jehovah's Witnesses have a reputation, a well-earned reputation for being argumentative. And unfortunately, many Christians can follow suit. They, they see the escalation and they jump right in with both feet. And next thing you know, you've got two people screaming at each other about the love of God. <laughs> right? I mean, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So it's better to be the one backing off from a heated discussion than to be the one that somebody else needs to back off from. That does not help our witness. And trust me, I've blown it in this area. I'm sure we all have. But really keep in mind that you've got to just step back and say, you know what, we, we really need to calm down, both of us. And I've had to do that on occasion. So, you know, settle the guy down and say, no, 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 no. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm sorry, if I've, I'm sorry if I've offended you. Let me rephrase this. Let me refocus. Pray. You guys know what arrow prayers are? You remember in the book of Nehemiah when he's sad before the king and the king says basically, hey, why are you sad? Okay, by the way, it's like a death penalty to, to be that way in the king. So all, all of a sudden, Nehemiah is afraid for his life. And then he says, and then I pray to the God of heaven. And then he starts talking to the king. So he didn't say, king, hang on a sec and start praying. It's one of those, help me, Lord. I'm in, going in, you know, cover me. Arrow prayers. You can pray that way all the way through your conversations, especially if the conversation starts to get heated. Pray, Lord, calm my nerves. This guy's driving me nuts. Help me. Help me love this person the way that you love this person. Help this guy to use his self-control too. So please don't let it get heated. Also, don't expect immediate results. It takes on average about seven years for Jehovah's Witness to come to Christ after they've left the Watchtower, if they come to Christ at all. Most of them become atheists or agnostic because in their minds, they view the organization as God. They would never tell you that, but that's true. They view the, they view the organization as God. So if the organization has been proven false, then God has been proven false. And they, they leave belief altogether atheist or agnostic. So it, it takes a lot of time to, to lead someone to Christ. And we know plenty, we've got relationships with plenty of ex-Jehovah's Witnesses. And we've heard lots of testimonies. And they have, they've even coined the term or the phrase, in the wilderness. I was in the wilderness for however many years. They've got a lot of baggage to unpack. They've got a lot of um, stuff that they have to deal with. It is, it is genuinely a cult in every sense of the word. So they've got a lot of stuff going on in their head that they have to 
really face that they've never looked at before. So don't expect someone to just drop to their knees on your doorstep and accept Jesus. You can certainly plant seeds, but it's going to take time to bust up the dirt, get that seed in there, water it, and somebody else later on down the line is going to harvest that fruit. All right, and that's why you don't give up, because uh, this, is, this is a spiritual battle. This is real spiritual warfare. It takes time. It takes a lot of effort. And we can't give up. The way that I view it is if you've got a Jehovah's Witness coming to your door, God sent them to your door. God is counting you worthy to preach what you believe, to preach the truth about Jesus and about salvation through faith alone in Christ. So look at that as an opportunity. Look at that as a blessing. These people are worth it. Like I said, we know plenty of ex-Jehovah's Witness Christians, and they make great Christians. I mean, they're ready to work, <laughs> that's for sure, because they're, they were already going to do that. Um, but don't give up. Don't give up on these people. They are worth it. Don't ever think that somebody isn't worth it. Um, which, let's see, I guess I didn't cover it, but the question that somebody asked about how do you know when, when is enough, uh, it's, with Jehovah's Witnesses in particular, it's really easy to know if you've got someone who is teachable. And of course, you don't want to take on the overt teacher role. But if somebody is constantly arguing something and, and they're not listening to the admonition of understanding you instead of refuting you, then you're really not going to get far with a person like that. If you build a genuine relationship with them, and there's a lot of give and take, then, then you've got a lot of liberty to, to spend time with that person. But if it's just not clicking, and it might not even click personality-wise. I mean, I've met some people that were JWs that I really, really got along with, and I've met some people that I really didn't get along with. And uh, I mean, <laughs> this one guy uh, with this Jehovah's Witness that I was meeting for 11 months, he brought this guy, and, uh, and this guy was, I'm just gonna say it, this guy was a jerk and really coming at me hard. And I, I literally looked at my friend and I said, where did you get this guy? I mean, he, you're just rude. And he said, you know, I'm just gonna shut up. And I said, good idea. So me and this other guy, we continued our discussion. The next week when we met, my friend was apologizing for this guy and said, you know, um, on the way home, I, I, I told him, I said, look, we had this conversation before we had the meeting. I don't want you to get how you normally get with people. And I'm thinking, if he was normally that way, what'd you bring him for? Which was exactly what his friend said. He says, well, you know how I am. Why'd you invite me? And I thought, my goodness, that's just who this guy is. And my friend had to apologize for him because he knew that this guy was going to get that way. And, and the reason why I was as blunt with this guy as, as I was is because I wanted to show my friend that I wasn't going to put up with s stuff like this. I could talk and I could communicate and we could have a good time. And, and I mean, that conversation lasted 11 months and he brought a lot of other guys, but he never brought this one guy because he knew that I had drawn a line in the sand and said, I'll take this, but I won't take this. And you have the right to do that. You don't have the right to be mean or nasty or anything like that. Um, but if God just brings someone who's not a good, perfect match for you to talk with, don't feel guilty in saying, you know, I, I really don't think this discussion is going to go anywhere. And we are instructed, Matthew chapter 7 talks about not casting your pearls before swine. And that may sound harsh, but those are the words of Jesus. He tells you, don't give what's precious to them because they're just going to turn around and tear you up. And a lot of times that's what happens is, is they will... They want you to say, oh, yeah, well, what do you believe? And if anybody ever asks you that question with that attitude, don't tell them. Because they're just looking for a, to define a target so that they can shoot at it. And what I believe is too precious to be placed before somebody that way. And I've literally had people get angry at me and say, what do you mean you're not going to tell me what I believe? And I said, well, because I don't believe you really have the ears to hear it right now. So maybe later, but sorry, not now. Yes. Oh, yes. My wife is reminding me. We have a newsletter called Backpacks and Briefcases. We send it out once a month. It's free. If you guys are interested, I'll just pass it around. You can sign up for it. Anybody know why we call it Backpacks and Briefcases? 
That's right, because if they show up at your door with a backpack, who are they? With a backpack. They're Mormons. Do you know why? Because you can't ride a bike with a briefcase. <laughs> right. Yes, sir. Okay, the Watchtower is really two things. It's a magazine and an organization. Okay, the organization is in Brooklyn, New York right now, and that is what Jehovah's Witnesses believe to be uh, God's organization. God has always used an organization in their view to reach people, uh, so that is the organization. So God speaks to the organization, the organization then disseminates that truth to everybody else. So where do they get their authority? They, they look at Matthew chapter 24, the parable of, of the wise and faithful servant. Uh, you know, Jesus uh, gives a parable, says there's a, a rich guy, and he takes off on a journey, and he puts this one servant in charge to, to feed everybody else, to, to feed his household. So they take that, they spiritualize it, they make it a prophecy, a parable into a prophecy, which is kind of interesting. And they say that, okay, Jesus left, and he put somebody in charge, and that faithful and wise, or faithful and discreet slave is their terminology. And our organization is the faithful and discreet slave, so we're the ones disseminating meat, you know, food, spiritual food to the household of faith. So they base their authority off of that passage. It is a group of men. Uh, there are seven, six or seven, one of them died recently. But there's six or seven men on what's called the governing body. Sort of, yeah. I mean, whoever's on the body picks somebody else, but they don't have a special number that they need or anything like that. Yes? Your presentation this morning has uh, brought this to attention of what my question is. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to ask if you would address it specifically of the feeling of the Jehovah Witnesses that comes to your door or Jehovah Witnesses that you know or um, that are influenced by that. It appears to me that uh, they have a great deal of fear. Yes. A great deal of fear. And you, you, you touched upon it, but I would like to ask you if you would express some about that emotion and how, as a believer in Christ and, and uh, the authority of the scripture, that how can you be able to talk into that without them having this emotional fear that's right up there. Okay, great question. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it because I want to get through this quick witnessing method and we've only got six minutes left. Um, but Jehovah's Witnesses have fear because they have no assurance of their salvation. It's based wholly upon their relationship with the Watchtower Bible and Track Society. So unless they're doing everything that the organization tells them to do, again, there's no assurance whatsoever. So they don't want to die in Armageddon. They don't want to be wiped out forever. They believe uh, that once you die, you cease to exist, uh, and they want to keep existing. So it's based off of guilt, fear, and manipulation. This, I mean, it's abusive relationship between the individual Jehovah's Witness and the organization. So the way that you speak into that situation is to focus on Jesus, and not necessarily his deity, but on how he treated people, how he treated the woman at the well, how he treated... Um, the, uh, uh, I forget the scenario, but the lady who came to him saying, you know, well, even the puppies get the breadcrumbs that fall from the table. You know, pointing out how Jesus treated people, how he loved people, that is something they are completely unfamiliar with. Can I get to you later? I really need to get through this here. All right, this witnessing method. <clears throat> um, now, they're really good with the doctrine of the Trinity, and not good, but I mean, they know what they're doing. They know their system of trying to trip people up. What they don't know is the resurrection. Our faith is built on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I had to correct somebody last week, non-Christian friend of mine. I told him, look, Christianity is not based on the teachings of Jesus. It's based on a historical event. Because if Jesus had not been resurrected like he said he was going to be, then his teachings mean nothing because he was not who he said he was. All right. So what I will do is I will, and if this, you can do this in five minutes with a JW at the airport. Ask them the question, do you believe Jesus was a prophet? And they will say yes. And you might think, what in the world does Jesus being a prophet have to do with the bodily resurrection? Great. That's what they're thinking too, except they don't know you're going towards the resurrection. 
So ask, okay, was Jesus a true prophet or a false prophet? I like to add humor when I'm witnessing. And they'll laugh. You know, of course he was a true prophet. Great, we agree. Jesus was a true prophet. So what if he is a, he's a true prophet and he gives a prophecy with a definite time element involved? What if it doesn't happen? What if that event doesn't occur? What does that mean? It means he's a false prophet. And if he's a false prophet, what else does that mean? He couldn't have died for my sins. He's not my savior because he's a sinner. And you, you, you can't have a sinful sacrifice. So if Jesus gave a prophecy with a definite time element involved and it doesn't come true, then he is not who he said he was. He's not my savior. He didn't die for my sins and I'm still in my sins. So my salvation is contingent upon the fact of Jesus being a true prophet. So then ask the question, what if Jesus said he was going to raise his physical body? Oh, Jesus never said that. Well, no, I didn't say he did. I'm asking the question, what if he did? If he did, would you believe him? I've, had, I've actually had one Jehovah's Witness tell me that he wouldn't believe him. At that point, the conversation was over because I was dealing with someone who was not interested in truth. And again, Matthew 7, 6. I'm not to cast my pearls before the swine. I'm not going to continue in that conversation with someone who is admitting to me that they're not going to believe what Jesus said. They are not ready to hear the rest of what the scripture has to say. You move on. But most Jehovah's Witnesses will say, well, yes, I will believe what Jesus said. That's when you take him to John chapter 2 and you read verses 19 through 21. This is in the New World Translation. It says, Jesus replied to them, tear down this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple was built in 46 years and you will raise it up in three days? But he was talking about the temple of his body. Now, that word in the Greek for body is the word soma, S-O-M-A. And in contexts like this, it always refers to a physical body. So what did Jesus say he was going to raise? His physical body. What if he didn't do it? He's a false prophet. Now the Watchtower teaches that Jesus was raised as, this is their term, not mine, a glorious spirit creature. I hate that term. I think of that old 50s movie, The Creature from the Black Lagoon, every time I hear that <laughs> phrase. But that's what they believe Jesus is. He's the first thing created by Jehovah God. He's a glorious spirit creature, and that's how he was resurrected, recreated actually, because according to them, when you die, you cease to exist. So Jesus didn't exist for three days and then was recreated from Jehovah's memory in a completely different body. That's not Jesus. So there's no continuity there. there. It's a completely different creature with the memories of the previous Jesus. So if Jesus said he was going to raise his body and I don't believe that, you can't, you can't call yourself a follower of Christ because you're not even believing what he said. So the Jehovah's Witness is at a place where they've got to choose one. Either you believe what the Watchtower says and disregard what Jesus said, or you believe what Jesus said and not what, what the Watchtower says. And that's going to tell you where their loyalty really lies. Does it lie with Jesus? Or is it rested upon what the Watchtower says? So they may come up with a bunch of excuses as to why Jesus didn't really mean what he said here. And I can help you answer those questions if you ever get this to this point with a Jehovah's Witness. But the plain fact of the matter is that Jesus said he was going to raise his body and my salvation depends on it. So do I have any questions? I've got, it's already 10 o'clock, but I'll take just a couple of questions. I had a quick question. Yes, ma'am. Is the, the cult dying? I mean, where are the new converts coming from? I do believe that it is dying. Um, and I think that's why they're moving out of Brooklyn, New York, is because they're not getting as much money in as they used to. Uh, the Internet is killing them. The only place that they're really growing, and they send out detailed reports every year, but the only place that they're really growing is in third world countries because they don't have access to the information. In industrialized nations, you know, you just, you Google Jehovah's Witnesses and, oh my goodness, the stuff that's going to come up. Jehovah's Witnesses are forbidden to go on the internet and do that kind of research. That's why they grow in places where they don't have access to that information. So I, I do believe that they are definitely on a downswing at this point. And do you send out your thing via email or is it actually hard copy snail mail? 
email? It's hard copy snail mail. Can it be email? It can, but we won't do it. Our board of directors has made it very clear that we need to send these out snail mail because we send out, we, we, increase, we put a little envelope in there and everybody knows what that envelope is for. Not everybody likes to give online. Some people still don't do that. So uh, while there are means for people to give online, we do have to put our newsletter out through snail mail. So. Yes. I think we have covered this because we came in late, but I was just wondering what is some of the background, like the history, the roots of this false religion? Really Actually, I didn't cover that at all. Um, and this will be my last question, and then I'll pray, and then we need to go. I can stay for a little bit longer to ask questions or answer questions. But Charles Taze Russell was the founder. He was uh, raised as a Presbyterian, <clears throat> got into an argument with uh, an atheist about the doctrine of hell. Didn't know how to answer the question, how can a loving God send people to hell? Became an atheist himself. Stumbled across, later stumbled across an Adventist meeting where they were studying the Bible. Realized that they didn't believe in the doctrine of hell either. And then within a year has basically become their pastor and is teaching the Bible. Got connected with other Adventist preachers wrote for another magazine, they had a falling out about the ransom of Christ, you know, uh, the substitutionary atonement. Uh, so Charles Race Russell stole this guy's mailing list, start, started his own magazine called uh, Zion's Watchtower in 1879, I believe it was, and became a prolific writer. I mean, the guy wrote tons and did a lot of traveling, a lot of speaking, and grew his ministry up from there. He died in 1916 on a train on Halloween Day in Pampa, Texas, while he was on a circuit, speaking circuit. And the guy that took over, Joseph Rutherford, he's the one that really grew the Watchtower from where it was to what it is now. Uh, and he was a very abusive man in lots of different ways. And I think that's why the Watchtower is so abusive is because it's got Judge Rutherford's personality, basically. So let me close in prayer, then I can hang out and answer a couple more questions. Lord, thank you for, uh, thanks for, thank you for your word. Thank you for how clear it is. And thank you that you've given it to us. Lord, we pray for opportunities to, uh, to put to use the things that we've gone over this morning. Please send Jehovah's Witnesses to our doors. And Lord, we know that you love these people just as much as you love us and that were it not for your grace, we could be in the same position that they're in. So Lord, we ask that you'd be saving Jehovah's Witnesses and, uh, and please use us to do it. It's in your name we pray. Amen.